Kia ora koutou katoa. Last Monday I drove out into the countryside to visit a family whose mother, wife, daughter, her name's Vicky, had died the night before. I'd officiated at Vicky's wedding some years ago, and before that her dad's funeral. Known this family since the 1980s. With the blessing of Google Maps, I found the farm, followed the horse trailers, knocked on the door and was ushered into the large lounge. The family were all there. Relatives, close friends, some I'd married, young adults that I last met when they were children. All sitting around, relaxed, chatting, comfortable with each other and with Vicky was lying there on a hospital-style bed in the middle of the lounge. They hadn't rung the undertakers in the middle of the night. No, they'd sent off some texts, one to me, and they stayed surrounding her all night till I arrived at 11 the next morning. At the funeral on Friday, they asked me to pray this prayer. Vicky, may the angels guard and comfort you as your soul leaves the bosom of this life, the arms of your family and friends, journeying into the great unknown. There may you know yourself to be held by the strong and resilient threads of love, spun between you and those loving you, threads we might call God. May you remember us, holding our smiles. May you forgive us, letting go of our hurts. May you bless us, recalling the good times. May you travel light and with love. And may you know yourself as we have known you, to be blessed, to be a blessing for others. Rest this day and forevermore in our peace. The theme for this sermon today is what is success? What does success look like? And my first thought was of Vicky, surrounded by her whanau, friends, her extended family in that lounge. Success looks like committed love. It looks like family. It looks like laughing and crying. It looks like the strength and resilience that had cared and nursed Vicky for over a year. Death in circumstances like these is not failure. Death comes sometimes too soon. And we push back, resist, we care, we try, we love, we hope. But in the end, death comes. And when it comes surrounded and held by the threads of love, threads that strengthen the living, not just the dying, then this is not failure, but success. Love that does the mahi, the work, of journeying with another, through thick and thin places, through loss and delight, in pain and in joy. This is what success looks like. It is gold. My second thought about what is success is the story printed today about the contented fisherman from a book called Song of the Bird by Anthony DeMello. I read, first read this tale back in the 80s, and it's sat in my mind ever since. It asks a question of us who are continually busy, and of our society, which values busyness, calls it productivity, and of our language around success and growth and value and profit. 
It's a little like that challenging verse from Mark 8.36. For what will it profit a person to gain the whole world and to lose their own soul? It's a story about soul. The moral of the contented fisherman story is not about whether one should be a fisher or an industrialist or the owner of a fishing business with many boats or a worker in the industrialist factory. But it's a story about knowing what contentment is, knowing what peace is and what brings you peace. Knowing when enough is enough, which is not easy. Particularly in a culture that values more, doing more, having more, and wanting more. We are stuffed with more. For contentment is not just our 2023 equivalent of lying beside our boat smoking a pipe. Contentment is a state of being. It's about being happy with who you are and what you've done. It's a daily soul discipline of rejecting the philosophy of more, of learning to be content with what we have, and of stilling that lying voice which says our worth is fundamentally in what we do and contribute rather than who we are and the love that threads through our lives. If you want a bit of a giggle, I suggest you Google Jesus and success. And there you will find article after article, American after American, trying to do the impossible with a camel and a needle. The impossible being taking the assumptions of modern-day, purpose-driven, growth-orientated, capitalist America and New Zealand, and trying to justify it all in reference to Jesus. So Jesus, according to the junk articles that Google threw up, had a plan, a strategy for the advancement of his kingdom, read multinational company. By empowering and investing in, don't you love that, investing in, a key group of disciples, read executives, underpinned by his hard work, go the extra mile, and willingness to risk sacrifice for a greater gain, dying, others thinking you're buried, then resurrected on the stock exchange. Success is a big word in America. A big word in American Christianity, some of which washes up here. Compare this with a piece written, with a few adaptions, about a hundred years ago by James Allen Francis, also an American. He called it One Solitary Life. Jesus was born in an obscure village the child of a peasant. He purportedly worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for maybe three years he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a home or made much money. He never lived in a big city. He didn't go to university. He didn't do groundbreaking research or start a successful business or set up a hospital or a church. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. He did none of the things that we usually associate with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only in his 30s when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away, denying him. He was turned over to the authorities, was beaten, and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. When he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments, the only property he had on earth. 
When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today he is probably the most well-known human being. I'm well within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings and politicians that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of humanity as much as that one solitary life. The challenge of this one solitary life piece is that it upends most of the markers we have for success. Not that I think we should stay home till we're 30, never form a romantic relationship and land up on a Roman gallows. Just saying. I don't think, despite Google articles, that Jesus planned too much of what happened to him. I think, and maybe I'm being too simplistic about it, but I think that Jesus discovered something of the breath and life-changing call of a love that was vastly bigger than himself. A love he called God. A love that sought reconciliation and justice and compassion across race, religion, gender, and the politics of empire. <clears throat> the latter not taking too kindly to his suggestions. Jesus' immersion in this love called God led the author of John 14 in our text today to say there's room for everyone in God, in love. A room for everyone. No matter how different or nutty or difficult you think others are or you are. And to say that if you want to see God, <coughs> know what God is like, then look at someone who is immersed in love. Who loves with a fierce, committed and joyful love. And to say loving like this, doing the mahi, the work like this, is the way, the truth, the life of a journey going through thick and thin places, through loss and delight, and joy and pain, to what success looks like. It looks like love. The means and the end are the same. That one solitary life was about the compassionate justice love that has the potential to bring incredible change and hope. Blessings to you this week.